Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, was subjected to a great amount of intolerance. Besides the abuse and discrimination, which was physical, economical, verbal, and psychological, the killing and torturing of his companions, the mockery, the lies against him and his message, the distortions, the intentional and tactful spreading of misconceptions, there were many attempts to end his life. We'll look at 13 assassination attempts on the life of the Prophet of Islam. The Qur'an was having too much of an impact and Islam was spreading. The polytheists were paralyzed by the carefully planned and speedy movement of Muhammad's followers towards their new home in Medina. The Quraysh were enraged that the Muslims had found a place in the Arabian Peninsula itself where they could potentially thrive. The men were seething with anger and despair. To discuss their concerns, a special council was held in a Nadwa council house, the parliament of Quraysh. The most prominent chieftains of the Quraysh were present. After much deliberation, they agreed on assassinating Muhammad. The plan was to hand over weapons to a band of young men, one from each tribe, and that they would all strike Muhammad at the same time, so that they would all be responsible for the murder. Since all the clans would have his blood on their hands, Muhammad's protectors would be incapable of taking them on all at once, and thus have no choice but to accept blood money, which they would gladly and easily pay off. Muhammad received a revelation containing a command to migrate, as well as information of the plot to assassinate him. He was instructed not to sleep in his regular and customary bed. He discreetly began making arrangements for his travels. Muhammad used to go to sleep after the evening prayer, and upon waking up around midnight, he would go to the Kaaba to perform supplementary prayers. On the night Muhammad planned on leaving, he asked his cousin Ali to sleep in his bed after assuring him that no harm would come to him. With the coming of darkness, the assassins surrounded Muhammad's house. They saw Ali and thought that he was Muhammad. The plan was for them to lie in wait for Muhammad and pounce on him when he came out from his house. The incident is mentioned in the Quran. When the rejectors plotted against you to imprison you or kill you or to exile you, they plot and plan, but God plans too, and God is the best of the planners. Although Ali was in Muhammad's bed, Muhammad was still in the house, surrounded by the assassins. He came out of his house and took a handful of dust and threw it at them while reciting the verse We have placed a barrier in front of them and a barrier behind them and we covered them so that they cannot see. The young men from the Quraysh did not notice Muhammad leave. He swiftly went to his close companion, Abu Bakr, who would accompany him, and they traveled together. But not towards Medina, but in the opposite direction, towards Yemen. Before dawn, they covered a distance of about five miles, and then they took refuge in a cave on Mount Thawr. Unaware of Muhammad's escape, the would-be assassins continued to wait for him to come out of his house. Only at dawn, when his cousin Ali woke and came out, did they realize that they had been outsmarted. He was one step ahead of them. Following Muhammad's escape from the joint assassination attempt, they interrogated his cousin Ali about Muhammad's whereabouts, but Ali pleaded ignorance. They then dragged him to the Kaaba and kept him captive there, but he divulged nothing. They then rushed to Muhammad's close companion, Abu Bakr's house, and found that he had also disappeared. When Abu Jahl understood he had been outwitted, he panicked and offered a price of 100 of the best camels for each fugitive brought back dead or alive. In a fit of rage, he went to Abu Bakr's house and asked Asma, Abu Bakr's eldest daughter, about the whereabouts of Muhammad and her father. She refused to tell them anything. Her calm defiance enraged them, and a furious Abu Jahl slapped her so hard that her earring fell off. And so begins the second of the 13 assassination attempts we are highlighting here on this video. They are not in chronological order, by the way. Quraysh, as we have already mentioned, had declared that whoever would seize Muhammad would receive a hundred camels as reward. This had spurred many persons to try their luck. 
among those who were on the lookout for the fugitives in order to win the reward was Suraka, the son of Malik. He, on receiving information that a party of four had been spotted on a certain route, decided to pursue it secretly so that he alone should be the winner of the reward. He mounted on a swift horse and went in hot pursuit of them. On the way, the horse stumbled and he fell on the ground. On drawing a lot so as to decide whether he should continue the chase or not, as the Arabs used to do in such circumstances, he found the omens unfavorable. But the lust of material wealth completely blinded him and he resumed the chase. Once more he met with the same fate, but paid no heed to it. Again he jumped onto the saddle and galloped at breakneck speed till he came quite close to Muhammad. Abu Bakr's heart became perturbed and he kept on looking back while Muhammad remained anchored and continued reciting verses of the Quran. Abu Bakr later narrated the incident. We emigrated while the Makkans were in pursuit of us. None caught up with us except Suraka, the son of Malik, on a horse. I said, O Messenger of God, this one has caught up with us. The Prophet replied, Don't worry, certainly God is with us. Suraka was close enough to the men that he could hear them, but this time the forelegs of the horse sank into the sand, and again the rider tumbled to the ground. Suraka cursed the horse, and with great difficulty managed to pull the horse's leg out of the sand. The repeated stumbling of his horse and his falling off awakened him to the situation and he realized that it had been a constant warning from God and that some unseen power kept stopping him from harming them. Being convinced that Muhammad would become victorious, he told him, Your people, meaning the Quraysh, have assigned a reward equal to the blood money for your head. He told them all the plans the people of Mecca had made concerning them. Suraka even offered them some journey food, but they kindly refused. In the end, Suraka aided Muhammad against Quraysh in his escaping to Medina by foiling the attempts of those who were in pursuit of Muhammad and his companions. When Quraysh failed to convince Muhammad to quit his mission, one of their most prominent of leaders and among the most fiercest of Muhammad's enemies, Abu Jahl, a man who was given the title the Pharaoh of this nation by the Prophet of Islam due to his tyrannical and oppressive ways, asked his comrades, Does Muhammad place his face on the earth in your presence? When they replied yes, Abu Jahl swore to them, saying, I call on God to witness that tomorrow I will wait for him with a stone which I could hardly lift, and when he puts his face on the ground in prayer, I will split his skull with it. Betray me or defend me, let the clan of Abdul Manaf do what they want after that. The Qurayshi people said that they would never betray him on any account, and that he could go ahead and follow through with his idea. The next day Abu Jahl took a stone and waited for Muhammad. Muhammad stood up to pray and the Quraysh sat in their place of gathering, waiting for Abu Jahl to execute. When he placed his face on the ground in prayer, Abu Jahl picked up the stone and marched towards him, till he got close. Suddenly, the onlookers saw him retreat before reaching Muhammad, who looked defenseless. Abu Jahl's hands trembled and he dropped the stone. He retreated, hands clawing in the air, and face pale with terror. We found two different accounts of what happened, so we'll mention both. The Quraysh asked him what had happened, and he replied that when he got near him, a camel got in his way. By God, he said, I've never seen anything like his head, shoulders, and terrifying canines. It looked like it was about to devour me. Found in a translation of Ibn Ishaq's Sirat Rasulullah. What happened? The people asked him. A trench of fire and a screen of devastation stood before him and I. Muhammad later explained to his companions that had Abu Jahl come any nearer, angels would have swooped down upon every limb of his. This is found in When the Moon Split, a biography of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, by Safiur Rahman Mubarakpuri, a compilation based on Arabic sources and originally written in Urdu, which was translated to English. After the famed Battle of Badr, which was the first armed encounter between the Muslims and the Quraysh, a decisive battle that gained the Muslims a historic victory, which was acknowledged by all the Arabs, and an encounter that dealt a heavy blow to the religious and economic interests of the polytheists. The Quraysh were burning with rage and fury. They held a bitter grudge and were overtaken by their resentment over their horrible loss. Two men volunteered to resolve the matter and quench their thirst. They would silence the source of their humiliation. Muhammad. 
Umair bin Wahhab and Safwan bin Umayya decided to assassinate Muhammad. Umair would carry out the deed and Safwan would pay off Umair's debt and support his family if anything were to happen to him. They kept their agreement to themselves and the plan a top secret. Umair applied poison to his sword and headed to Medina. He went there under the pretense of checking up on his son who was a prisoner of war. A companion of Muhammad, known for his keen eyesight, Omar bin al-Khattab, caught Omar at the door of the Prophet's mosque and immediately gathered that he was here with evil intentions. He went and informed the Prophet of Islam. Omar made it inside, within close proximity of Muhammad, accompanied by his sword in its sling. Good morning, he offered as a greeting, to which Muhammad responded, God has been gracious and taught them a greeting of the inhabitants of paradise. Peace be upon you. Muhammad inquired about Umair's visit and as to why he had his sword dangling in front of him. Umair presented his excuse and told him that he had come to see his son and to ensure that he was being treated well. Regarding the sword, he cursed it and said that it had gained them nothing. Muhammad pressured him to spill the real reason for his visit. Umair remained obstinate, refusing to change the answer he gave earlier. Muhammad then articulated Umair's secret mission to him. This took Umair by surprise. He was astonished and immediately bore witness to Muhammad's prophethood. Safwan, who was in a good mood anticipating the assassination of Muhammad and the redemption of honor after their loss at Badr, was flabbergasted and overtaken by disappointment at the news that Omar was now a devoted Muslim. During their way back from a journey, Muhammad and his companions took a break. The Prophet of Islam rested under a tree. He hung his sword there and took a nap, only to be awoken by a polytheist. The man had picked up Muhammad's sword and unsheathed it. The Bedouin stood in front of him and asked, Do you fear me? Barely awoke and not at all perturbed, Muhammad responded, Not in the slightest. Who will save you from me now? The man asked, sword in hand. God, Muhammad replied calmly. The man dropped the sword and the tables turned. Muhammad now held the sword and posed the same question. Who will save you from me now? You got me now, the man said. Please. He pled for mercy and received it. Muhammad invited him to believe in the oneness of God, but the man declined. He pledged never to fight against the Muslims or support anyone against them and was set free. He then told his people that he came to them after having met the best of people. And so ends another attempt of the many attempts to end the life of the Prophet of Islam. You know, these people are pretty intolerant. After facing years of persecution and oppression and being politically weak, the Prophet of Islam, who was then a resident of Medina, came back and conquered Mecca. There had been major wars and multiple skirmishes, and the final straw for the Muslims was the total disregard of and breaking of the treaty that Quraysh and their allies had agreed to live by. The Quraysh aided an ally of theirs in their surprise killing of 20 men from a tribe, Banu Khuza'a, who the Quraysh had an agreement with. In the end, after all the bitterness, disrespect, belligerence, and heartless persecution the Quraysh showed the Muslims, Muhammad forgave them all. He stayed in Mecca for about 19 days after the victory, which is most well known for the unprecedented amount of humility, mercy, and forgiveness the Prophet of Islam showed his most starkest of opposition. But still, a young man from Quraysh, Fudala ibn Umair, was angry and upset at the loss and defeat, so he attempted to kill Muhammad. If he succeeded or even managed to injure Muhammad, there was almost no chance of him surviving. But he did not care. He concealed a dagger and planned on attacking Muhammad when he did his ritual walking around the Kaaba, because everyone gave Muhammad a little personal space when he did so. So he sneaked up behind Muhammad and said to himself, I'll kill him now and whatever happens will happen. But just as he was about to pull out the dagger, Muhammad turned around. He saw Fudala and said to him, Are you Fudala? Fudala replied, Yes, it's me. Muhammad then asked him, what were you conversing to yourself about? To which he responded, Nothing, I was just remembering God and circling the Kaaba. Muhammad laughed and said, I seek forgiveness in God, then placed his hand on Fudala's chest. Fudala later remarked, On God, he had not even lifted his hand from my chest, but by then there was no one more dear to me on this earth than him. And so, 
Fudala accepted Islam, thus bringing an end to yet another plot to assassinate one of the most influential men in all of history. Okay, so this incident has to do with what is known as the Medina Charter. And if you enjoy reading as much as we do, check out the first written constitution of the world. And you could supplement that with the covenants of Prophet Muhammad. Alright, so there was an agreement in place, a quite reasonable, tolerant and fair agreement. In the first year after Muhammad left Mecca for Medina, he set up a constitution for Medina. All the tribes in Medina came together and agreed to abide by the rules set by what is known as the Charter of Medina. It was in everyone's best interest to do so. Fair, fair, good deal. The charter called for law and order, being just, and mutual assistance between the different tribes in protecting and defending Medina. This entailed physical as well as financial assistance. We must abide by these standards and we must work together. So let's get the backdrop, as this one requires a little bit of history. A chieftain from the region of Najd named Abu Bara met with the Prophet of Islam. He didn't accept Islam, but he didn't reject it either. He suggested that Muhammad send some of his followers to the area of Najd and invite its people to Islam. The chieftain assured Muhammad the safety of the Muslims and suggested that many people in the region would be receptive to their message. You see, the way it worked was, if a respected and established tribe gave protection to someone, Anyone who had an alliance with that tribe, or anyone who didn't want to go to war with that tribe, recognized that protection. Don't mess with them, and thus extended their protection as well. And so, with the protection of the chieftain and the potential for mass conversions, Muhammad sent a large number of Muslims who were well versed in the religion to go and invite the people of Najd to Islam. However, as the Muslims camped at a place called Bir Mauna, and a messenger from them went to a man named Amir bin Tufail, who was also a chieftain and a poet, blood was spilled. The messenger, who besides being a messenger, was under the protection of Abu Bara, a senior chieftain, was murdered in a shocking and deceptive manner. He was done so under the orders from the local chieftain, Amir bin Tufail. But he didn't stop there. Ibn Tufail called on his tribe, Banu Amir, to attack the rest of the Muslims. However, majority of them refused to break the pledge of protection made by Abu Bara. So Amir bin Tufail called on a bunch of other tribes to do the deed. All of the Muslim men were massacred, except a wounded man who was left for dead and another who was freed by the chieftain. He's from the Mudir tribe. You, go. As the freed Muslim man rushed back to Medina, he met two men from Ibn Tufail's tribe, whom he killed. Everyone stays armed, strapped as usual, no biggie. However, the two men whom the Muslim killed had a peace agreement with the Prophet. And thus, we get to our incident. So, even though a chieftain from Banu Amir was responsible for massacring the Muslims who had been given protection, the Muslims still honored their end of the agreement. When they go low, we go high. And so, Muhammad ordained that the Muslims would compensate the families of the two men who were killed in the misunderstanding. I thought they were at war with us. No, all of them are in bad, and we had an agreement ensuring their safety. The set price for the compensation, according to their law, was that of 100 camels for each man. That's 200 camels, a massive amount indeed. But not to worry, according to the Medina Charter, all parties who signed the agreement were jointly responsible for matters such as this. So the Prophet of Islam, along with some of his companions, went to Banu Nadir, a Jewish tribe who lived in Medina, to ask them to contribute towards the compensation, something that the Medina Charter required them to do. Banu Nadir were a wealthy tribe who lived inside fortresses. When Muhammad and his companions came to them with their request, they told him that they would fulfill his request and asked him and his companions to have a seat against the wall of one of the fortresses. Have a seat right here. And so begins the plot to assassinate. As Muhammad sat leaning against the wall, a chieftain from Banu Nadir consulted with his people and came to the conclusion that this was a great opportunity to assassinate the leader of the Muslims. They would throw a big boulder off the roof and crush him. It would be a violent and gruesome death, but a quick one and everything was set in place and ready to go. Violating the Medina Charter and assassinating the Prophet of Islam was risky business. But the Muslims seemed a little weak as of lately. About 80 of them or so were just recently massacred, and they lost a major battle with the Quraysh, so they felt they could handle the consequences. A man from the tribe urged them not to follow through. 
but his advice fell on deaf ears. A man from the tribe rose to do the deed. Suddenly, Muhammad stood up and walked. He rose and left without saying a word, not even to his companions. After waiting a while and not knowing what happened, the companions decided to leave as well. The Prophet was on his way back to Medina. They caught up with each other and Muhammad informed them that Angel Gabriel had instructed him to leave right away. He informed him of their plan to assassinate him. Treachery by an ally was no light matter and their alliance was no longer. Muhammad sent a messenger to Banu Nadir who informed them of their plot and even identified the man they had chosen to carry out the mission. They were given 10 days to leave. They could take with them whatever they could, but none of them should be seen after 10 days. Banu Nadir, recognizing the severity of their action, which was treachery and treason, began preparations for the departure. They were getting ready to leave, but the story didn't end there. We, however, will continue on to the next attempt to assassinate the Prophet of Islam. After having left the persecution in Mecca, life in Medina was not a bed of roses for the Muslims. They repeatedly had to defend themselves and often found themselves the subject of great hate and enmity. One such source of hostility was from a region north of Medina, known as Khaybar. Eventually, Muhammad and his followers were victorious over the people of Khaybar. However, as we have already seen, not everyone played by the rules. Foes awaited the opportunity to attack and bitter souls concealed venomous ideas and ill will towards the Muslims. After the conquest of Khaybar, as Muhammad and his companions rested, a meal was presented to them as a way of showing honor to the new ruler, a roasted lamb. But things are not always as they seem. An agreement was made between the people of Khaybar and the Muslims, and during the negotiation of the surrender, a woman named Zainab bint al-Harit, the wife of a slain leader from the tribe, inquired and learned that the Prophet was fond of lamb shoulders. So she cooked it up, with poison that is, a poisoned lamb with extra poison on the shoulders. How thoughtful! Muhammad picked up a morsel, as did her companion. After placing it in his mouth, the Prophet immediately spat it out without swallowing. He instructed everyone else not to touch it. However, by that time, one of his companions had already swallowed a portion. Muhammad summoned Zainab bint al Harith and questioned her about the matter. You know what you have done to my people, she told him. I thought, if you were a prophet, it wouldn't harm you. And if you are not a prophet, we should rid ourselves of him, meaning a fake prophet. Muhammad forgave her. However, a while later, his companion who ate from the lamb died from the poisoning. So she ended up receiving the death sentence for his murder. During his illness before death, Muhammad stated that, I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Khaybar. And at this time, I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison. During the sixth year of the call, leaders of the Quraysh remained defiant and terribly hostile towards Muhammad and his message. One day, Abu Jahl went off. He went on a tirade against the Prophet, claiming that he was insulting their forefathers and their gods. To ensure that his words weren't taken as mere hyperbole, that is, exaggerated statements or claims not meant to be taken literally, he offered a bounty of 100 of the best camels on Muhammad's head. This was an open call to violence, but at this time, no one really dared to take up the offer. However, this type of inflammatory rhetoric did have its effects and eventually came to fruition. Omar bin al-Khattab, a rare man with an all-in personality, formidable presence and an intimidating physique, blinded by the pride for his forefathers and his deep-seated traditional bigotry, let hate get the best of him and took up the cause. One day he went to the gathering place of the leaders of Quraysh. He heard them discussing their issues regarding Muhammad. The Quraysh had explored many different avenues of putting an end to Islam, but they haven't been successful. Omar had heard enough. I'll take care of it, he said. What's the big deal? He took his sword out of his sheet and went on his way to find Muhammad. A man on a mission and he was not playing around. Along the way, he ran into Noaim bin Abdullah, a Muslim who had not publicized his faith. Noaim knew Omar and seeing that Omar had a sword in his hand, asked him, What are you trying to get into, Omar? I want Muhammad, Omar replied. He further explained, This man, heretic, who has abandoned his religion, he has divided the efforts of Quraysh, made fools of some of our most respected men, tarnished our religion, cursed our gods and deities, 
so I'm going to go and kill him. Finish him off. Seeing how upset Omar was, and given his reputation for being a serious individual, Naim tried to persuade Omar to abandon his task. He really seemed hell-bent on harming the Prophet. By God, you're deluding yourself, Omar. Do you think that Muhammad's family will let you walk around freely after you have killed and murdered one of their most noblest of men? He posited to Omar to get him to reconsider. Retribution was a certainty, but Omar wasn't phased. Naim, out of desperation, resorted to plan B. Have you not considered going to your own people and fixing them first? This was news to Omar, and he was livid. Who in my family? He demanded from Naim, somewhat in disbelief. Your brother-in-law, cousin, Saeed bin Zaid, and your sister, Fatima. It's true and I'm for real. They have both accepted Islam and follow Muhammad, so you should deal with them. Omar changed his tracks and went to his sister's spot. When he reached the house, he heard someone reading the Quran. It was Khabbab, and when they heard Omar's footsteps, he hid. Fatima hid the parchment on which the verses were written. Omar stormed into the house and demanded to know what she was listening to. When she didn't tell him, he plunged towards her husband and started beating him severely. I heard that you guys apostatized, he shouted. His sister rushed to rescue her husband and was struck. We're Muslims, yes. We believe in God and his messenger. So do what you want. We're not going to denounce our faith. Seeing his sister's face bloodied, softened Omar, and he became remorseful. Let me see what you were reading, so I can see the message that Muhammad has brought. Omar had had an experience with the Quran in the past, and it did have an impact on him. Fatima believed her brother, but told him to go and wash first. No longer in a rage, Omar cleansed himself and read what was on the parchment. Verses from Surah Taha, he was overwhelmed, mesmerized by the beauty and power of the message. He turned towards the two and said, Take me to Muhammad. I need to go now. What's your intention? Fatima asked, still weary. By God, I don't mean no harm. I only want to go there so I can accept Islam. As he said this, Khabbab came out of hiding. He congratulated Omar and informed him that just last night, the Prophet made a prayer saying, Dear God, bring honor to Islam with the one who is most beloved to you from amongst these two men, with Amr ibn Hisham or with Omar ibn al-Khattab. And it seems like the Prophet's prayer was accepted for you, Omar. Omar put his sword inside the sheet and made his way to Darul Arqam, a house in which the Muslims used to meet in secret. At the time, the house had some people inside it, and a companion went to see who it was that had knocked on the door. It's Omar with his sword, he said with a great sense of alarm. Hamza, a man known for his fighting skills and bravery, was ready for the action. If he has come with good, then we will take care of him. And if he has come seeking evil, then I will disarm him and kill him with his own sword. He said with assurance. Omar walked in very quietly and very calmly. Muhammad. Someone who was known for being very welcoming was also a man of great fortitude and poise. On this instance, knowing Omar and his tendencies and capabilities, he swiftly went up to him and grabbed him by his garment, pulled him closer. He admonished him, O oh son of Khattab, you just won't quit making trouble until the punishment of God falls upon you. What's your business? A subdued Omar gave in, O oh messenger of God, I've come to accept Islam. And that is the assassination slash conversion story of one of the most influential men to have ever lived. In the ninth year after the Muslims migrated from Mecca to Medina, the Muslims found themselves yet again having to defend their honor and prestige. They have survived many difficulties and hardships and have expanded a great deal. But now, there was news of an impending Roman expedition against them. against them. And thus, they found themselves in a long and difficult journey across the desert in the peak of summer. The expedition of Tabuk, also known as the expedition of difficulty. Because it was probably too hot in the daytime, I'm guessing. Their numbers were large, the largest yet. However, not everyone was on the same page. Muhammad was the head of state in Medina, and by now Mecca as well. But before he took his office in Medina, there was a man who was just about to rule the city. He reluctantly professed his belief in Muhammad, but in reality harbored severe hate against him. The man would later be known as the leader 
of the hypocrites. They were very small in numbers, but being from within the ranks granted them the opportunity to cause much damage. One night, during the expedition of Tabuk, during their travels, they actually made an attempt to kill Muhammad. He was on his camel, on top of a cliff, and a bit isolated. They rushed in on their horses, faces masked, to intercept him. Fourteen or fifteen in number. The plan was to throw him and his camel off the cliff. An almost certain death. It was in the darkness of the night they came. On horseback, speed was the key. Timing was everything. Their anxiety was through the roof. They were spotted. One of Muhammad's companions alerted Muhammad, and he quickly outmaneuvered them. Did you know who they were? He asked his companions that were with him. Negative, they replied, but they knew the horses and what tribes they belonged to. They are the hypocrites till the day of judgment. He then informed them that their intention was to throw him off the top of the valley. His companions inquired about their sentencing, suggesting that the tribes that each man belonged to be given the responsibility of executing their sentence, that is, executing the men. The Prophet declined. He did not want the people saying, Muhammad used men until God gave him a clear victory and then disposed of them. Instead, he prayed for their demise. Many delegations came to the Prophet of Islam. On one occasion, two men, Amir bin Tufail and Arbad, came to Medina and met with Muhammad. Amir, a rude and ill-mannered individual, asked, O Muhammad, what will you give me if I embrace Islam? You'll have the rights that the Muslims have, and you'll be responsible for what they are responsible, replied Muhammad. Will you make me your successor if I embrace Islam? questioned Amr. That is not your right, nor the right of your people. However, you can be the commander of the horsemen, the Prophet offered him. I'm already the commander of the horsemen of Najd. Give me rule over the desert, and you keep the cities, Amr demanded. The Prophet refused. As the two men were leaving, Amir threatened the Prophet, By God, I will fill it, meaning Medina, with horses and men, meaning war. God will prevent you, responded Muhammad. After they left, Amir notified Arbad. Arbad, I'll keep Muhammad busy talking to him so you can strike him. Surely if you kill Muhammad, the people, meaning the Muslims, will accept a compensation for the killing. They would hate to wage war over his murder, so we'll give them compensation. I'll do that, agreed Arbad. They went back to Muhammad. Hey, Muhammad, stand next to me so I can talk to you, Amir said, and they stood next to a wall, talking. Amir gave his man the signal, and Arbad went to grab his weapon. But his hand froze when he touched the handle. He couldn't get it out of his sheet. You only get a small amount of time when you're dealing with a man like Muhammad. The mission was a failure. Arbad and Amir bin Tufail left. At a stopover, they were met by two companions of the Prophet. Come, you enemies of God, the curse of God be upon you. They yelled as they approached the men. Amir and Arbad fled. Not long after, Arbad was struck by a lightning bolt and perished. As for Amir bin at tufail he carried on to a different location and ended up with an open ulcer. Look at myself. I have an ulcer as big as a camel's dullah, which is an inflated, pink, tongue-like bladder. While I'm dying in the house of a service lady, he complained, for reputation's sake, he mounted on his horse and rode off into the darkness. He died on his way back to his people. Well, it did not end well for those two men. Arbad's incident is referenced in the Quran. When God intends for a people ill, there is no repelling it. And there is not for them besides him any protector. He is the one who shows you lightning as a fear and an expectation and generates the heavy clouds. The thunder glorifies his praises, as do the angels in awe of him. He sends thunderbolts, striking with them whoever he wills, while they dispute about God. And he is mighty in strength and severe in punishment. When Quraysh's attempts at character assassination had failed, they resorted to simply silence the man. By now, three major battles had already taken place, and it wasn't going well for them. The first one was a major loss, the result of the second was a stalemate, and the third was a failure and a decisive victory for the Muslims. Abu Sufyan was now the de facto senior leader of the tribe. He announced a bounty for anyone who kills Muhammad. A man from amongst the Bedouins took the job. He was supplied with all the necessities, weapons, food, and he was en route to Medina to complete the mission. 
The man lied and said that he was there to accept Islam. It worked, and he entered the mosque of the Prophet. As soon as Muhammad saw him, however, he told his companions there, This is a man who has treachery written on him. He was immediately apprehended. They found a dagger. The would-be assassin Bedouin was given two options. If you are truthful, I'll let you go. Otherwise, the man came clean and gave it all away. And so, staying true to his word, Muhammad, the man with the title, a mercy to the world in the Quran, let him go. The Bedouin accepted Islam. By now you've seen that Muhammad did not have an easy life. There was no shortage of trauma. The Muslims, especially the early converts, faced severe persecution and made great sacrifices. One incident paints a reality of a people suffering tremendous abuse and torture. In the early days of his mission, there was ridicule, hate, and well-organized campaigns of misinformation spread against Islam. Muhammad showed courage and possessed extraordinary resolve. He showed determination in the face of oppression, be it physical, verbal, or psychological. One day, as he stood praying in the courtyard of the Kaaba, the hostilities took a turn for the worse. Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayd, one of the elites of the Quraysh tribe, came and grabbed Muhammad by the shoulder. He took a hold of his garment and started twisting it so as to strangle him. A few seconds of pressure could result in permanent damage. A couple of seconds more, death. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion rushed to his aid. He pushed Uqba off Muhammad. Will you kill a man because he says, God is my creator, sustainer, and provider, my master? The move proved deadly. Uqba was a leader of the set. Approaching him in that manner was not taken lightly. He was surrounded by a bunch of ruffians who were encouraging him. And when they saw Abu Bakr step in, they jumped him. They beat him heartlessly. The attack was so severe that Abu Bakr's mother didn't think he would make it. The incident mirrored an episode found in the Qur'an. It was that of Moses and Pharaoh, and a man who aided Moses. And Pharaoh said, Let me kill Moses, and let him call upon his Lord. I truly fear that he may change your traditions, or cause mischief in the land. Moses replied, I have certainly sought refuge in my master, and your master, from every arrogant one, who does not believe in the day of account. And a believing man from the family of Pharaoh, who concealed his faith, said, Do you kill a man merely because he says, My master is God, while he has brought you clear proofs from your Lord? 